Lindsay Davis has long been a friend of the society. She's spoken at many of our events, but the one that always sticks out in my mind was at Kirby Hall in, in, back in the year 2000. And Kirby Hall is a massive reenactment event uh, run by English Heritage, and about 1,000 or 1,500 reenactors turn up, and, and 20,000 of the general public turn up to, to watch them do their stuff. Um, and anyway, we'd booked uh, the historian David Starkey to speak, and he got stuck. Yes, it is that David Starkey that was mentioned <laughs> yesterday by uh, Philippa Gregory. Uh, and he was booked to speak, and he was stuck in traffic somewhere, and he phoned my mobile phone, uh, but he didn't actually phone my home phone, and so we didn't know what was happening with him. And um, we, were, we were fairly calm about it. There was you know, about 200 people waiting in the hall for him to speak. And, but we, uh, the first thing they did was um, a friend of mine took my, my young son, who was at that stage about nine months on, and presented him as David Stark, and luckily, luckily they laughed. Um, <laughs> But anyway, we were running out of delaying uh, techniques, and then Lindsay turned up. She, was, she had the next talk, and um, she was early. And anyway, I said, you know, we were a bit of a bodge, but yeah, it would be fine for you. And she said, oh, shall I go on instead? And that's Seize fixed her character. The moment. <laughs> <laughs> that's fixed her character in my mind. It's, it's profess professional, it's helpful, it's decisive, it's brave. But it's also got a canny judgment about it because she quickly spotted um, that in some ways it was better for her to speak to Starkey's audience rather than her, her own audience because, and she was quite right because there were these 200 people there and, and, they, and they loved it. And um, anyway, other more eminent people obviously agree with my assessment of Lindsay's acumen because she's now the chairman of the Society of Authors and of course I'm sure you all know her as the author of the most fantastic series of novels. Ladies and gentlemen, Lindsay Davis. Thank you, Richard. I remember, it must be 20 years ago, some lad from a cottage in Devon wrote to me and said he was thinking of setting up a historical novel society. And I will tell you the straight truth, I thought, he's bonkers. <laughs> And I have just said to him, it's about time I actually joined, isn't it, Richard, really? Which I will do, I promise you I will do. But I've known the society for a long, long time. And I'm really pleased to be here today and see this wonderful event, joint with our strange cousins from you know where. Um, <laughs> And here you all are, having the most fantastic time. I wasn't able to come, I'm afraid, for, for the earlier parts of it, but I looked on the website and I wished I could have done the bit about bring, bringing characters alive, because I'm sure I, I could have learned a lot from that. And method was very attractive. I didn't know you could have method in writing historical novels. I was very confused by the mention of a blog role, which um, could so easily be misread by an English person, and indeed was by me. And by golly, I wish I'd been there when somebody said there was a glut of Roman books. I would have had something to say. <laughs> I also secretly wish I'd come in disguise and done a pitch, but I'm actually frightened they might have said no chance to me. <laughs> I've been writing now for 25 years. I have 24 books all in print, which have never gone out of print in this country and some others. So I, I can tell you a lot about historical novel writing. On the other hand, I'd be bonkers to tell you how I do it. Do not expect me to tell you what I do. It would be like a biscuit manufacturer coming and reading out their recipe. I will try to avoid giving you any useful information at all. I don't do Twittering, Facebook, any of that stuff either. Um, I do have a website which has been there for quite a long time, so I do engage. I'll never know whether I could sell more books if I did Twittering, etc. But what I do know is that I wouldn't write as many books as I do, and for me, that's the point. I'm feeling a bit old at the moment because I had the kind of letter recently that authors get quite a lot, I'll be alluding to this um, in, several times in fact in the talk. In the talk. Um, this one came only a few days ago and it went as follows. Dear Lindsay Davis, I hope you don't mind my writing to send you a proof of Rosemary Sutcliffe's Sword at Sunset, which the company, I won't 
mention them because I'm so irritated, are reissuing in December 2012. You may well be familiar with the novel, beloved by many after it was first published in 1963. And if not, then perhaps Rosemary Sutcliffe, who is best known for her classic million selling The Eagle of the Ninth. That's why I feel old, really. I actually remember Sword at Sunset being published, so that really dates me, doesn't it? And I, I thought it was strange that an editor who wanted to get me on his side didn't know enough about me to know that I was bound to know who Rosemary Sutcliffe was. I will say no more. I will progress on. A little bit of fantasy, because I know there's a lot of writers here, or would-be writers, who would like to be um, encouraged, perhaps, I'm not sure that's the right word, and a lot of curious readers who, who would like to see a little of the background, as it has been for a very long time, probably. I, I think some of you are going to the Museum of Lo London, which is my local. Um, Greenwich, where you were yesterday, you were actually within about 10 yards of me, but I was hiding under the duvet. Museum of London, excellent. Of course, you don't want to go to the really good Roman galleries. They are the best I know anywhere, but you don't want to write about the Romans because there is a glut. Remember that. Be careful. <laughs> What you want to do is to ask them about a cache of documents that I say they discovered, preserved in the ewes under what's believed to be the remains of an Elizabethan inn, including what seems to be the personal correspondence of one William Shakespeare for a period in 1599. Some would believe that this is around the date of the first performance of The Tragedy of Julius Caesar, which you may have heard of, I, I believe you probably have. Perhaps the first play to be put on at the then newly constructed, which means reconstructed because they'd carried it piecemeal across the river, Globe Theatre on the South Bank. Imagine the playwright awakening and stretching in his garret room and thinking, hey ho, what a fine life when I have no need to get up until I'm ready. I can slouch around in a baggy shirt and can spend my days happily scribbling, yay, and getting paid for it and winning fame. When the recovered contents of Will's intray are dried out, unrolled and deciphered, which I imagine will be using scientific techniques like those which have been so successful at the so on the sodden Vindolanda tablets and the blackened scrolls from the Villa de Papyri in Herculaneum, I, I wonder how much resemblance there'll be to letters and emails I myself read as an, receive as an author. A lot, I suspect. Let's think about that. Greetings, Will. Just a quick note from Virginia to say we love your work out here, even though it takes too long to reach us on the endless sea trip. When are you coming over on a repertory tour? My wife and I will be happy to put you up in our log cabin and introduce you to our dog, Hamlet. Meantime, keep them coming. <laughs> Hail. I've been trawling through playbills and notice you have the same name as me. This is so cool, William Shakespeare. <laughs> age 12. You would be amazed how many of those I actually get, though they don't say William Shakespeare, obviously. Another young person. Dear Mr. Shakespeare, I just want to say I love your work, and I think your heroine, Lady Macbeth, is the best ever. She is so feisty and clever. I have made her my role model. Alice, age 15. <laughs> now, this is one that would make Will's heart sink. Dear Mr. Shakespeare, I'm a great admirer of your work, particularly the neat plotting, subtle characterization, and sardonic humor. I myself have penned a play, which, <laughs> which I'm calling Leofric, King of Wessex. It is in seven acts, all of which are needed in order to expound the story. And although it has been suggested this may make staging difficult, if the audience is willing to spend a little extra time, I believe they can be won over to appreciate its qualities of ritual action merged with philosophical insight and magical realism. Can you advise me on getting it performed? I don't care about the money. <laughs> I just want to hear my humble words spoken by actors. In fact, I'd be willing to pay the Chamberlain's men myself. For some reason, there's a large angry rent in this scroll. Then there's another which you'll realize from what I said earlier is, is terribly familiar to me. Dear Walter Shukespaar, I, I hope you don't mind me writing out of the blue. One of my colleagues suggested you were a suitable person to approach. We here at Deptford Productions are very excited about our wonderful new author, Christopher Marlowe. 
I'm not the sort of audience member who wants to wade through hours of historical fact before the story gets going, and I think Kit Marlowe has the same quality that you have in your writing, the ability to breathe life into a place and time long ago. His work is alive with detail in the most compelling way. I'm enclosing a proof of his latest drama, and although I realise you must be extremely busy, I hope you may find time to savour it and perhaps pen a commendatory scroll. Much of the wording there is taken from real letters that I have received. <laughs> Finally, here's the real business. This is not just the longest piece of correspondence that they'll show you at the museum, but if scientific tests confirm what appears to be the case, it's written in very unusual green ink. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Dear Mr. Shakespeare, I've seen and enjoyed all your plays to date, and I'm a great admirer of your work. Now, I can tell you, for an experienced recipient, that is the moment when a warning bell sounds. New paragraph, low. I recently attended the first night of your play, The Tragedy of Julius Caesar, which seemed to be well received by both the groundlings and gentlemen. I was rather surprised by this. To my mind, in this play, you have abandoned your previous attention to detail, particularly with regard to historical accuracy. As early as Act 1, Scene 1, I noted a speech which went, Oh, you hard hearts, you cruel men of Rome, you, you not Pompey. Many a time and oft have you climbed up to walls and battlements, to towers and windows, yea, to chimney tops. The use of the word chimney tops in the context of ancient Rome is a reprehensible slip. I was sorry to find this sloppiness in the choice of modern vocabulary continued. In Act 1, Scene 2, the rabble flung up their sweaty nightcaps, and Caesar himself plucks open his doublet, neither of which form part of ancient Roman dress. Other important scenes are marred by the same mistakes. At a crucial moment in Act 3, Caesar accosts the soothsayer, the Ides of March are here, I Caesar but not gone. Then Artemidorus interrupts, Hail Caesar, read this schedule. Schedule jars horribly schedule for those of you who are foreign. <laughs> Worse follows. As Brutus and Mark Antony vie for oratorical supremacy in the funeral speeches, you make repeated mention of them and sending what you refer to as the common pulpit. I would expect an author such as yourself to know that the correct form of word should be tribunal or rostrum. There may have been other instances of this nature, but in the press of people at the play, I had neither space nor time to note them down. Until now, I have been a faithful follower of your work, but in future, I must avoid it due to this plethora of annoying errors. <laughs> there is more, because, of course, there are clocks in Julius Caesar, but I, I think I've given those of you who want to write a flavour of why you shouldn't ever do it. <laughs> just, just have a real job. Now I want to take you back in time. My job, I'm a historical novelist. We're going to 1985, and indeed 86, 7, and 8. You may think that's not far enough for a historical novel, and indeed, according to my definition, it isn't, because my definition, no book set in a period that I can myself remember can possibly be a historical novel. <laughs> I, I actually take issue with the Ellis Peters historical daggle dagger where the definition is that a book submitted may be set in any period up to 35 years prior to the year in which the award will be made. That's dangerously close to saying that for fictional purposes, half my life or more is a historical period. I, I'm not keen on that. Onward. 1985, I wrote my first really good piece of purple prose for publication, my resignation from the civil service. Trust me, I'm really proud of it. It ended, frankly, I would rather sweep roads. My, my mum, it was passed around, I can tell you. People, people gasped and said, oh, wish I was brave enough to have written that, while thinking, thank goodness I still got my job. <laughs> my mum thought I'd damn myself and I'd never get a reference for another real job. But I was offered interviews, and that was really what told me I didn't want a real job. Um, I realised I was 35, I had some experience of life, especially its miseries, which are always so invigorating to write about, and no whining dependents who'd expect food on the table. So this was that chilling moment where I would try to become a writer. I think I always defined it as I was going to be a historical novelist. Never, it never entered my head to be any other sort of novelist at all. I didn't know then that if you want to be taken seriously as a historical novelist, 
either first you have to have be or have been, but preferably still be, a professor of history who wants to be revered by cringing inferiors, or a literary novelist who's run out of ideas and thinks they'll slum it in costume for a few quick bucks. <laughs> Am I bitter? No, no. <laughs> the reason I want to talk about 1985 is that after a flirtation with women's romantic fiction, I decided that as my Civil War serials in magazines were not being accepted by publishers for real book publication. Too humorous, too political. I had to change the period I wrote about. And that is an interesting moment for all of us to think about now. I was very innocent. I didn't know what, I, I don't know what you've been told at the conference, but I now understand there are rules for would-be writers. I lay them before you, and some of you may groan a bit. You have to be 20 photogenic and blonde, whether you're male or female. <laughs> One of your parents must be a famous writer. You should be a journalist with useful friends. You don't have to sleep with an agent or editor, but how can it do harm? <laughs> there has been talk even today, earlier at the conference, about writing to what is already marketed. Um, but sure, these are honourable publishers. I didn't know that you should do that. I thought I could try to be original. Quite wrong, of course. Never attempt a period where there are no popular novels already. Why did I choose the Romans? Folly, total folly. You should copy a big name. For heaven's sake, how can you be called the new Mimsy Bloggins if you haven't heard of Mimsy and modelled your work closely on her books? Indeed, why be shy? Just go straight in there and write in the style of Lindsay Davis. A Roman novel set in the 70s AD with a hero called Marcus. Then your editor can send the manuscript to me and ask for a jacket quote, which of course I will eagerly lavish upon you, especially if you don't think anyone should mess about with historical detail. There's no women cluttering up the book and the tone is relentlessly serious. The clincher to get my attention will be to put in a cat. Trust me, I just so love that. Back in 1985, 1986, 1987, and 1988, I had no idea, and I sat down like a biscuit manufacturer thinking, if this period, the Civil War, which I'm writing about, isn't selling, I'll get a new one. So I started to write Roman novels. I tried to interest publishers in something called The Course of Honour. Actually, it wasn't called that. It was called Kindness and the Caesars, which my dad said sounded like a jazz band. Bad move. Or oh, possibly good move. It was a straight love story about the Emperor Vespasian and his mistress, as some of you may know. And then I tried to interest them, while well, they were still thinking about that for year after year, in The Silver Pigs, a Roman detective series of a spoof nature, which you may also have heard of. All of us, readers and writers, should remember what I was told over and over again. They all said there was no market for historicals. They all said there was absolutely no market for novels set in the Roman period. They all said a straight love story about the Romans would be impossible to sell. Readers couldn't take it was one of their excuses. Too difficult, too obscure, even though it had been on the telly, Derek Jacobi being I Claudius. If you go into any book, bookshop now, you know, you'll see how true that was. But what a terrible mistake I made for 1985, 6, 7 and 8. I have on the wall of my study a letter that my agent later found, and I'm going to read that out to you because... This is, this is good fun too. It's dated the 15th of September 1987 and it comes from Arrow Books, who by an exquisite, truly exquisite turn of fate, later became the publisher of the Falco novels, as they still are. But at that time, a bloke, who I won't name, said to my agent, Dear Heather, I have to write this in a hurry and I'm about to go off on holiday. I read with enjoyment the enclosed material for the Silver Pigs, which you kindly sent me. I like the atmosphere and I like the setting for the story, though sadly I find it all a bit too jokey for my taste, so I think I'd better return it. That's a pity. I believe he's still working in publishing and I bet he still thinks that was a pity. 
I just float it past you as a, an interesting sideline and perhaps for those of you who want to write a moment of hope. Going back to my allusion to the professors, I do sometimes ask myself, would I do this any better if I was a historian? If I break my own rule for a moment and do tell you how I do it, you'll see that the answer is a fierce no, because I write novels. My degree was in English literature and language. I always mention both because I think they are equally important. And I put it to you that my success is based on narrative, character, plot, and dialogue. The history, we're on the back page, yippee, is not actually central to writing the novel and the enjoyment people get from it. I could, I believe, write a strong, picaresque novel set in modern times using exactly the same talents that I apply to historicals, but his contemporary details instead, based on the kinds of things I'm interested in, architecture and street life, political shenanigans at national and local level, people in their neighbourhoods, tragedies, especially their effect when they occur unexpectedly and to what may be ordinary people. Love, betrayal, greed, ambition, industry, logistics, trade, travel, even publishing and writing. If you're a satirical novelist, that's really good to do, I can tell you. Setting my ideas in history lends a kind of distance. It's not only escapism for the reader. It gives me a kind of separation, neutrality, from which I can work as a writer to be passionate and incisive without the flim-flam of modern life getting in the way. Perhaps, if I, perhaps I want to be in control. Perhaps I want to say, I'm telling you, this is how it was. Actually, I do believe a writer should be authoritative. A mistake too many wannabe writers make is to be too hesitant. If you don't know that you believe your story, why should anybody else? The thing is, going back to 1985, I knew that readers were brave. If I could just get my book in front of them, it would take off. And indeed it did. It didn't ha we didn't have Twitter and blogging and all of that in those days, but we did have that thing called word of mouth. Librarians were particularly helpful, but readers themselves did what they do now with my books. They talked to one another and said, this is, this is new, this is exciting, try this. Um, if you give them something interesting and make it accessible, they are not scared. They want good stories about people who excite and intrigue them, stories told in a strong way. They have an appetite for information, though, for heaven's sake, don't make it didactic. Personally, I think that as well as heroes called markers, they want women, jokes and dogs, but don't take my word for it. And for me, readers want to trust the author to be telling them, as far as we can know for sure, what life in another period might really have been like. But again, plenty of folks seem to write in a different way, so what would I know? 24 books, everyone still in print. Think about it. You're here this weekend because you know these things already. But we should aff affirm it anyway, I think. Readers of historical novels want to escape from the troubles of the present into a different world for a short time and then come back to reality cheered and refreshed. The size and success of this conference proves it. I will take questions, but be warned, I won't necessarily answer them. <laughs> Oh, come on, come on. <laughs> You'll compel me to say, and now I'll tell you about my latest book, Master and God, available in paperback from last Thursday and out there. <laughs> there is a hand at the back. Where's the microphone, lady? Thank you. That was a great speech. Um, I was wondering, going back a bit to what you said about you have to be 20 something and blonde and good yeah, looking. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's what? too late for you. <laughs> I'm, I'm it would never have been. <laughs> she's she's brunette for those of you who can't see. I'm brunette. See. I'm brunette. And uh, we'll pass, as I was. We'll draw a veil over the rest. Yes, um, we we do. We have to, dear. But um, I was wondering, you didn't really sort of go through what what we would do in your opinion 
if we're not. And, you know, <laughs> well, you'd do what I did. You'd carry on anyway, because you would believe that being a historical novelist was a wonderful thing. You would, I hope, believe that you had something to say that was good and you could say it well. I haven't stressed quality, but you know, I think that. Um, and until the money ran out that kept you able to do it, and I can tell you with me, it was the very month I had the Silver Pigs finally reached the stage that I got a cheque in my hand. I had to borrow the mortgage. I could not have gone on another week. So how scary is that? You, you would persevere. And if, if you are persevering, and that means you're writing new books every year while the old ones don't get accepted, actually you're doing the very best thing you can. You are practising. It's always we go from the back to the front. We should have a sort of circular motion, shouldn't we? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I loved your speech. Thank you. Um, I only recently read Course of Honor, uh, was very familiar with the Falco books, enjoyed those very much. I also very much enjoyed Course of Honor, and I'm surprised to find out, was that one the first that you That's wrote? That's first. Shall I tell you about that? Because yes. this, this is really instructive. Yes, please. Um, my very first attempt at writing in the Roman period became a serial in a woman's magazine, and it, I hope, was good. I haven't looked back at it for many years, um, but it was too slight to be a proper book. So then, as the roof started to leak, and I knew time was closing in because um, I did need to mend it, I, I found the story of Vespasian and Kindness, which I still am amazed no novelist had ever written about before. It is, it's so perfect because you have true love, heartache when they separate. They come back together, more sobbing into tissue boxes. They are together, and then he becomes emperor, and you think he can't take her with him. The point being, she's a freed slave, so he can't actually marry her and shouldn't, shouldn't be seen to be living with her. Uh, and then he, in, historically, he did. So what a great story for a romantic historical novelist. And I, the other thing about it was that Antonia Kynis was the secretary of the mother of the Emperor Claudius, so she had worked in the kind of yes minister office that I had worked in for my last job in the civil service. So not only did I know about love, which, believe me, don't get me going, I know about love. Um, <laughs> I knew about that kind of political environment. Um, I, I once drafted the first draft, I was very junior, so it was only the first draft, of the reply to Prince Charles's speech about the carbuncle. So um, that, gives you, that gives you an insight into my past career, which I shouldn't have told you. We can't have this on YouTube because I have signed the Official Secrets Act three times <laughs> and I'm not allowed to tell you that, of course. <laughs> the Court of Honour was where I found that thing they tell you about in, in writing schools. I found my voice. I wrote seriously with the kind of authority that I, I mentioned to you earlier. I knew that, how to write that book. And um, it went to an agent who eventually did become my agent, though she wouldn't say at that stage she, she, she would take it. In fact, she said she couldn't get it published. So I then wrote The Silver Pigs to use up the research, really, um, that I'd done into Vespasian Jerome. And The Silver Pigs would have been my last throw. The Silver Pig she did manage to sell and then she agreed to be my agent and we were off. The Course of Honour stayed, not literally in the back of my wardrobe, but stayed with me because I knew it was good for 10 years. And I think people who read it now um, would say it's possibly my best book. I'm, I'm very proud of Rebels and Traitors, my Civil War book, and also Master and God as well where I write in the same sort of passionate way about the Romans, um, more politically. When it was published, it was disguised as a Falco novel, although, it, as the lady said, it's nothing like a Falco novel, really. And nothing was done for it. I was paid much less than I paid for most of my books. It was hidden away. It was published on the 1st of January or maybe the 2nd of January. There was no promotional material for it. 
Uh, it is still in print. It is loved by thousands. Um, and I am very proud that it did get printed in the end. Um, if you have a book that you believe in, be heartened by that. Be encouraged to keep it. And one day show it to someone who will say, as my editor did when he finally saw it, he, he'd known for 10 years that it existed. When he finally saw it, he said, this is wonderful. Why haven't I been shown it before? <laughs> I'm nearly crying. <laughs> Another question. At the back again. You should have known you could have been running that way. Thank you. Is there going to be another Rebels and Traitors, or at least something set in the Civil War around that period? Have you given it up? <laughs> I don't know. I never know more than about a book ahead, actually, to tell you the truth. Um, I eventually went to write about the Civil War, as, as we've now alluded to. Um, this is 20 years into my career pretty well. And to be honest, I wrote the biggest book I possibly could because I thought they might never let me do it again. And anyway, I'd been dreaming about it since I was 14. The starting point was my hometown, which had a really nasty incident happen there. So I, I knew about it in the days when social history wasn't taught at all. I only knew about what happened to Birmingham because I lived there and there was a rather strange mosaic on a wall. When I said to my editor, the same one, that I wanted to do this book, he, he expressed interest. And when I said what the starting point when I was 14 had been, um, you, you may like to know this, he went white and he said, I can't possibly sell a novel, a historical novel that's set in Birmingham. <laughs> Um, for those of you who don't know, Birmingham is the second city of our glorious country. It, it grew after the 17th century. It started making swords for the parliamentary army in, in the 17th century and then became one of the great industrial cities of Britain. Ironically, it never had the Romans, and that's actually why I'm not an archaeologist. Um, but it's... It's supposed to be a place people joke about, especially the way people speak. You've heard me speak. Is it funny? No, of course it's not. It could be if I talk like they talk there. But we won't do that. I didn't tell him that another big section of the book was set in Newport Pagnell, which is a service station <laughs> off the M1. Uh, and then, and this is, this is also instructive about editors, I said, no, you will like it, Oliver, because it's got death rape and pillage. His eyes lit up. Yes, do it. <laughs> but, as I say, I threw everything I, I knew about into that book, and I don't think I probably will write a, a whole book. I might write short stories. I have written a short story set in that period, or something else. There's a reason why I'm, I'm saying this, but I won't tell you what it is. Um, my my Future novels will probably not be set in the Civil War, and they won't be sequels, because I am on the parliamentary side, and what happened was that the monarchy came back, and I find that a somewhat depressing period. You have to enjoy what you write. You really do. You can say, Charles II, wonderful, rumbustuous, good costumes, but actually, if you care about politics at all, no. I might one day write something else that isn't Roman, though. I very much liked changing period. Um, it was wonderful to do different kinds of research. The Romans I researched in certain ways. The, the Civil War I researched actually in the British Library, which doesn't have Roman stuff because it's British, I think about it. Though at the same time, I was, I was researching what it's like to go back to being a student and being in a library, and I was able to use that in a Falco novel called Alexandria, which is about the great library at Alexandria and um, it's it's so wonderful to use the same experience of research for two different things ever frugal um, I like the 18th century I did a lot of quite lengthy and quite expensive research into the 18th century not long ago and I wanted to to do that but now it would be too big a task so it, that's on hold but that's probably where I'll go to answer the question finally any more mm -hmm. may I ask a question you may but then there's someone at the very back <laughs> but no Jenny ask yours first <laughs> 
You've been <laughs> running about. You yeah. deserve a question. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Very sweet. Um, I'd like to ask how on earth you manage your time. I'm a childless orphan, which I can tell you helps a lot. My partner conveniently died. That helps even more. I have more time than many people would have. And this is perfectly serious. When I actually decided to leave work, <laughs> leave the civil service and do different work, um, it, was, it was actually a clincher that I didn't have to earn a living for other people. If I'd had dependents who would have suffered in those 85 to 88 periods when I earned no money to speak of, I wouldn't be here today. And that's a very sad thing to say because lots of people have had pleasure from my work. Um, how do I manage my time? I'm apparently totally undisciplined. I get up, I read the paper, I mess about. I don't actually start writing creative work until about three o'clock in the afternoon. And then I stop at 5.15 quite often to watch Pointless on TV. <laughs> so, so my writing is done in a very condensed way. I do not mess about. I, I really hate people saying that they, they are writers when they don't get down to it. I, I've got a sort of Puritan streak in me that says, you, you do it. And to be honest, when, when I'm writing a Roman detective story, if I can't do it fairly briskly after 20 years, it would be a pretty poor show, wouldn't it? I do actually know how to do those. So I haven't got to go through the stages of, of um, taking things apart. When, when the editor said in the earlier panel that she goes through five drafts with authors, I was seriously horrified at that thought. I do a draft, I polish it, I give it to Oliver, we do the editing in one go, which actually consists mostly, I shouldn't say this because someone senior to him from Hodders is here, but it's mostly it's lunch, to be honest. <laughs> um, I spend 10 days doing what he suggested and that's it. That's it, even on new kinds of books. We, we are, both of us, we work very well together. So to some extent, I've written to the editor. I even put things in thinking, he won't like this. He'll make me take it out. And he does, if he's awake when he reads it. <laughs> um, you can learn. You can learn to write well. My very first books probably had more work done to them than later, but very soon in my career, I was, I was doing it that way. And, and so that's, that's how I manage my time. Thank you. You have such a good passion for life and good humor. I'm wondering, what do you read for your own pleasure? What's reading? Blimey, I don't have time to do that. It's a very sad thing that I now read m many fewer historical novels and many fewer detective novels than I used to and than I would like to. I keep thinking one day I'll retire and I'll be able to read all these books that are piling up in this bottom shelf in my library. Um, it's, it's work to write historicals and historical detectives in particular. And so I read completely different things, mostly biography set in any period. I do actually like history, strangely enough. So I'll, I'll read anything about people in the past and places in the past. And coming from Birmingham, we are, we are very much into things like industrial archaeology. And I'll read completely different things, gardening books, for example. There's, there's a lady. What books influenced me? She's asked the influence question. Ah! Maybe not particularly influenced, but what did you love to read whenever you, before you became a writer yourself? What historical novels? Which historical novels would you go back to in your... I I'm still do. <laughs> yes, all right. Now, there's two questions here. There's what historical novels did I read? A perfectly good question. And there's what influenced you? I... 
I do not model myself on anybody else. I write like me. And one of the things people say is, it's got your voice. You've heard my voice today, so you, you can judge if you go and buy Master and God afterwards and I sign it for you. <laughs> Slip that one in, didn't I? Um, but I, I, I was a historical novel reader in my formative years, and I started with Rosemary Sutcliffe. And Rosemary Sutcliffe, obviously, for the Romans, I, I did actually buy Sword at Sunset the first day it came into Hudson's bookshop in Birmingham, so that's, that's why this bloke <laughs> got up my nose. Um, I read the normal people. I read Jean Plady to some extent, for example, though she, wa she wasn't my favourite. I read Margaret Irwin to some extent. I rem Right. Those sort of writers I read. Um, I remember reading some male authors. Um, Trees I read, I, definitely. The one who was devastating to me, and I've always said, nearly made me think I couldn't be a writer, was Dorothy Dunnett. I bet as Dorothy Dunnett fancier. I was overwhelmed by her books. The range of them, the size of them, it was seeing a big fat book that first got my attention. Um, the historical detail, but used, used for the story, not just shoved in to say this is daily life in Mary Queen of Scots time. Um, her vocabulary, frightening vocabulary. The colourfulness of them. The fact she did politics, my, my father was a politics lecturer, of course it doesn't show in my work at all that I'm interested in politics, does it? Um, I grew up in a very political family, so the, the fact that her books were, or certainly her Lyman books were um, very political, was a joy to me. Um, I did read Robert Graves, let, coming on later, um, and other other magisterial books about the Romans. Eventually I read um, Margaret Yorkiner's Memoirs of the Emperor Hadrian novel. There was a novel that is not much talked about, but which I was also, um, I, found it, I found it very different by a woman whose name I've forgotten, but somebody here will know. It's called Desiree and it's about, yes. Anne-Marie Salinka, Anne that's right which is about um, Napoleon's first love, so it goes wrong. It is the story of Napoleon, but it's also about a woman who marries a man who's not handsome. Now, I read this at a time when I was reading a lot of romance, and I thought heroes had to be handsome. So um, Bernadotte was a big bloke with a big nose who became king of Sweden. And moreover, she goes with him to be queen of Sweden and doesn't like it and leaves him for a long period. I think they got back together eventually. So this was true love which didn't work. That was a shock and interesting and made me think a lot of things. That's, that's probably enough, isn't it? I, also, I read Biggles and Hornblower. <laughs> a lot of everything. I could, three a day if I could get hold of Biggles. Anybody else, or are you desperate for your lunch? You're desperate for your lunch. I don't blame you. Right. We are ending. Women are putting their handbags over their shoulders. That telling moment. Thank God she's going to finish now. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Thank you, the uh, inimitable <laughs> Thank you. Lindsay Davis. We know what that means. <laughs> there is a final chance for you to buy books. Um, <laughs> Lindsay Davis, uh, Gillian Bagwell, Barbara Ewing, Jean Fullerton, Lois Levine, VM Whitworth, Christina Courtney, and Liz Harris will all be signing their latest books for you in the gy old gymnasium gallery now. And there's lunch to be had, and you can... You can take your lunch and get things signed. You can move around. You know, you don't have to choose the belly or the book. Um, <laughs> no, I don't can, mind if you have both. a sandwich, <laughs> so long as I get one. <laughs> um, and also, 
we won't be reconvening here. I think in one of the earlier programs it said we'd have a reconvening after lunch and a, a final thing, but we've, we've not got the rooms that we did have and what have you. So this is it. Um. <laughs> he should um, say until next time, shouldn't he? <laughs> Just agree that yeah. you want another one. And I, I don't know when the mu uh, university want to move us on, but maybe 2.30ish. Anyway, it reminds, for, it reminds for me to thank everybody, all our fabulous speakers, but especially our terrific conference team, so ably led by Jenny. <laughs> and all you guys for coming along and making it work. It's, it's, it's an audience thing. Uh, it's, it's people meeting one another. And here's to HS Florida 2013. <laughs>